Sheikh Ahmed sent Babakir two visas and tickets for Rehana and for her daughter to travel with her along with a letter of employment. He also sent 15,000 rupees and 500 US dollars. He ordered Babakir to help Rehana get her travel papers, give her 10,000 rupees, and the American dollars, and keep the remaining 5,000 rupees for himself. Before he met Rehana to give her share, he sought out his girlfriend and asked her for a date because he had some very important good news to share with her. The following day, after he filled her stomach up with food, sweet dishes and whatever else she desired to eat, he revealed to her the good news and showed her the promise letter. Then he asked her to marry him. Jamila's selfish ambitions quickly weighed the pros and cons and agreed to marry him if certain conditions were met. It was on a Saturday evening when Babakir received the promise of Jamila Malik's hand in marriage. After that, he went to meet Rehana and handed her the money sent to her from Sheikh Ahmed, along with the visas and tickets for her trip. Babakir was afraid that someone in the apartment where he was staying might steal these important documents and money from his bag. His roommates were having a party and many foreign boys and girls were invited. His friends were celebrating the end of their exams which concluded on Friday. Every one of them had invited his girlfriend and his girlfriend's girlfriends. Each girlfriend would bring her boyfriend and there would be a wild and loud gathering of young people losing control of themselves. Essentially, it was fear of getting drunk and losing all the important travel papers and documents that drove Babakir to ultimately decide to give them to Rehuna with her share of the money. Then. He promised her that as soon as the two passports reached his apartment he would come and hand them over to her. He added that her sponsor had already booked her flight and he told her the date and time of her flight. Giving Rehuna possession of her paperwork relieved Babakir of responsibility in this regard and left him free to enjoy the party with his friends. The only person at the party who would be without a girlfriend was he. Babakir mentioned the party to Jamila and that he would like her to come but she told him she wasn't that kind of girl. So, he apologized and promised never again to ask her to come to the apartment where he was staying because she was not his wife yet. After Jamila refused the invitation to the end of exams party, Babakir went to the liquor store, bought one bottle of rum, and headed back to the apartment for some fun. That night 19 girlfriends and boyfriends gathered at the Vicola apartment and jubilantly celebrated one less semester to worry about. The party continued until 2.30 am in the wee hours of the morning and it might have continued until daybreak if the Indian neighbors had not called the police and reported the loud noise. The police barged in and kicked out all the guests, bringing some measure of peace to the apartment complex. No one was arrested because two bottles of whiskey and 500 rupees was offered as ransom to release the transgressors of calm and quiet. The bribe paved the way for the police to allow four of the girlfriends to stay with their Sudanese boyfriends and send the other five couples on their way. The next morning Babakir was so tired and exhausted from all the goings-on of the festive occasion that he slept like Rip Van Winkle. He would have slept until the following night if the Kalina police had not shown up at his door. Babakir woke up with a yelp when he felt someone jerk him out of bed by his left leg. When he opened his eyes and saw a policeman hovering over him, he thought he was having a nightmare. The police grabbed him by the upper arm and forced him to stand on his feet. Without saying anything to him, the Indian policeman lead Babakir by his nightshirt to the living room. He was shocked when he saw more than ten members of the Kalina Police Department inside the apartment. All of his four roommates and their four girlfriends had been forced out of their beds and brought into the living room. Babakir asked his Sudanese friends in Arabic why the police had come back. None of them had a clue why their apartment was being raided once again by the cops. One of the cops shouted at Babakir and told him to be quiet. While the nine foreign students were sitting in the living room surrounded by six fully armed cops, the other police inspectors went inside their bedrooms and began to search their bags and cupboards. After every bag and cupboard was ransacked, the Bombay narcotic officer claimed to have found what he was looking for. Then, they informed the nine foreign students that they were under arrest for smuggling and selling drugs. In India, 
it would better to be arrested under the charge of first-degree murder or a terrorist plot than to be charged with smuggling drugs. The Indians believed that the murderer would kill one person and the terrorist would blow up a few thousand people, but the drug dealer would kill millions and cause widespread devastation to all of society. Even more, in Bombay the common misconception was that each and every African student that came to India smuggled or distributed drugs. While this is by no means correct, the facts show a predisposition for this type of infringement. One would not be exaggerating if one claimed that most every Nigerian student in India was in some way or another involved in some clandestine operation. Almost every week a Nigerian student was caught at the Bombay Sahara International Airport with drugs in their luggage. Sometimes, Nigerian students were caught with drugs inside their body cavities. When the Bombay Narcotic Division decided to get tough on drug traffickers, the Nigerian students came up with new tactics to evade capture and detection. The drug mules would encapsulate the drugs and swallow them. The capsules would remain intact for a few hours before their digestive system would dissolve the capsules. In the event that the capsules were not removed within the specific time frame, the person would drop dead. It didn't take long for the police to catch on and soon scanners were brought in to detect drugs hidden in cavities and in people's stomachs. Having said that, one could say with confidence it wasn't true that every African student was involved in drug trafficking. Regardless, many Indians believed that every black person came to India not for studying but for drug trafficking. In Bombay if someone hated a foreign student and wanted to destroy his life he would find a way to hide drugs in his bag or apartment and then he would make an anonymous phone call to the police and report him being involved in some kind of drug activity. Another way some Indians would harm foreign students was through false medical reports. In the city of Aurangabad, a Sudanese student fell in love with the daughter of the police commissioner. When the father came to know of the affair, he broke up their relationship in a very cruel way. By the way, most Indian universities will administer a mandatory AIDS test for all foreign students at least once. If the test results proved positive, the foreign student would be deported. When the police commissioner found out about the love affair between his daughter and the black student from Sudan, the commissioner had him arrested and then retested for AIDS. He then bribed a doctor at the civilian hospital to produce a positive result. The Sudanese student was blacklisted and deported back to his country. After raiding the foreign student's apartment, the Bombay Narcotic Police Force found drugs in Babakir Ali War's bag. A word of truth must be said here. During my 14 years of living in India, I never heard of a Sudanese student taking drugs or dealing drugs or being arrested for a drug offence. I lived three years in Nagpur, one year in Ahmedabad, and ten years in Bombay but I never saw or heard of a Sudanese student being involved in drugs activities. The apartment where Babakir was staying with his four Sudanese friends was in one of the tallest four buildings in Vakola. Each building was at least ten stories high. This part of town was called Vakola Colony and surrounded by high fencing. There was only one way to get in and one way to get out and that was through the main fenced gate. During the day the community was always protected by a watchman sitting in a small booth with a big long stick. There was another guard during the night watch. Each guard would cover a 12-hour shift. There was a third guard whose duty was to to make rounds during the night and keep hitting the pavement with his baton. It was imperative that he strike the asphalt making a tat 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 sound. The colony was well guarded during the night by the watchman who sat by the main gate and by the guard who circled the fence during the third watch echoing his location with his billy stick. When I arrived, new in India, I was puzzled by the night guard who kept up this meticulous ritual all night long, keeping me from a restful sleep. The following day I asked my Indian friend Vishwas the reason for this continuous disturbance throughout the night. He told me that burglars identify the strikes of a stick as a guard on his rounds awake and alert, as opposed to sleeping in a corner of the building. The residents would hear the sound of the stick and know the night guard was awake and vigilant and hence they could sleep securely during the night. Night guard tapping was a phenomenon in every city and town in India. 
Another strange thing about the night guards is that they would always be from the Nagaland state. I asked my friend Vishwas, why are the night guards always from Nagaland state? He said because no one could keep watch throughout the night or stay awake going in circles and striking the ground except a man from Nagaland. I could not refute my friend because I couldn't do the job even if they gave me a thousand rupees for each night. Nagaland people are citizens of India but don't look like Indians. They resemble Chinese and Japanese in features and height. The Vakolas colony had two guards during the day too. The first guard was the watchman whose duty was to sit for twelve hours in his booth at the gate and make sure no stranger entered the compound unless express permission was given by the relevant apartment owner. The second guard was called the liftman. In India, the elevator was called a lift. If you say elevator in Bombay most of the people would not understand what you were talking about. The liftman's duty was to sit inside the elevator from 8 am to 10 pm. If anyone came between 10 pm to 8 am he or she, no matter how old, had to use the stairs to get to his or her apartment even if it was on the 14th floor. The liftman had a lunch break and a dinner break. If someone came during the lunch or dinner breaks, they had to use the stairs at these times too. The liftman had a key and it was his duty to lock the elevator during his breaks and while he was off duty. His most important duty was to keep an eye on who came in and who went out. If someone managed to jump over the tall fencing or fool the watchman and made his way to the elevator, the liftman would not allow him to go any further. He would not be able to use the stairs either unless he was a resident of the colony and had a key to unlock the door to the stairway. The liftman had a stool inside the elevator and it was his duty to sit there all the time on the stool and watch with his eyes wide open all the residents and visitors going in and out. His duty was also to protect married women and young girls from being harassed and or attacked in the lift. Since Vicola's colony was relatively well guarded by night and day, how did the drugs end up in Babakir's bag? There were several possibilities, either one of the ten visitors who was invited to the party somehow entered Babakir's room and put the contraband there to implicate him or someone entered the apartment when no one was there and put the drugs in Babakir's bag. The four Sudanese flatmates were exempt from suspicion because they were all arrested at the same time along with their girlfriends. Only someone above the law would attempt to do something like that or a person lacking adequate mental capacity would be so stupid as to do such a crazy thing. It would be highly unlikely that all five friends were persuaded to leave the party at 2.30 am by the cops leaving room for the drugs to be placed in Babakir's bag. Another possibility is the only reasonable assumption left to explore. If someone broke into the apartment in their absence, Babakir and his other four roommates would have found out about the break-in and they would have reported it to the police or complained to the secretary of the colony. Every year the residents of each colony would get together, select a secretary from among them, and pay him a salary. If anyone had a complaint about his neighbors or any problem in his apartment, he would make a complaint to the secretary. The only other possibility was that someone either had stolen the key from one of the five roommates or had a spare. All the spare keys were kept with the secretary. It was breaking and disturbing news when the midday newspapers in Bombay published the arrest of the five Sudanese students and their girlfriends at Santa Cruz, the Cola colony. It was the first time that Sudanese students were arrested on drug charges. All 1,900 Sudanese students at Bombay University went to the colony and tried to find out how this could have happened. None of them believed the charges. The huge gathering of the students in front of the colony led the secretary to call the police and disperse them. At the police station, the five Sudanese students and their four foreign girlfriends were battered and tortured. The so-called confessions were compelled by force right out of their bleeding mouths. Narcotic police interrogators were crueler than other police divisions. Whatever they wanted you to admit, they would force you to admit it and then record your confession and use it against you in court. Among the nine foreign suspects, Babakir's face was almost unrecognizable after the relentless beatings. Not even his mother or his father would have recognized him. They broke all his front teeth and blinded his seeing eye. The area around his good eye was swollen shut and disappeared in its socket. 
Every single inch on his bare naked body had received heavy blows with an iron rod. He was beaten to the point where he could no longer cry out and could only muster a feeble groan, struggling to breathe through his broken nose. His jaw was dislocated. Some of his ribs were broken. Some of his fingernails were plucked out. In the third world, there are no people more evil than the police. People would say, if your finger becomes a policeman cut it off. I believe all those heartless police officers will burn in hell for all eternity. Muhammad Khan, the devil's advocate, had done all he could to ensure Rehana Khan and her daughter would not be flying out of the country. He bribed his informant at the passport office and ordered him not to send the two passports to Babakir's address but instead he was to send them to his office. The informant complied with his request and the two passports were sent to Muhammad Tours and Travels. As soon as the passports reached his hands, the self-anointed overlord of Gehenna incinerated them with fire. He knew that burning the two passports would not in itself enough to stop Sheikh Ahmed in his tracks and prevent his beloved Indian woman from being delivered into his hands. Rehana could still complain about her missing passports and get new ones reissued. He remembered that Sheikh Ahmed had told him that an Indian woman arrived at the Jeddah International Airport and claimed to be Rehana Khan. On that basis, his travel agency made a complaint to the airport that two of its clients' passports were stolen from his business. He then bribed one of his operatives at the Sahara International Airport to blacklist the passports of Rehana and her daughter and if any female passengers showed up with passports issued in these names, Rehana Khan and Ifat Khan, they should be arrested immediately. The devious scoundrel still wasn't satisfied with the two obstacles he had created to block Rehana and her daughter from flying to Saudi Arabia. He wanted to do something to secure his evil scheme. He expected that Sheikh Ahmed had sent the visas and tickets to Babakir to give to Rehana. So, he decided to steal the visas and tickets from the Sudanese boy. He already had gotten the address of the apartment where Babakir was staying. He contacted a notorious Ganda at Vakola and hired him to do his dirty work. He told the Ganda to enter the apartment of Babakir and remove the visas and tickets issued to Rehuna Khan and her daughter, Ifat Khan. In place of the visas and tickets, drugs were to be planted inside Babakir's bag. The masterfully wicked man hated nothing more than catching one of his employees or former employees doing something behind his back or refusing to obey his commands. For that reason, he sent Jamal Khan to jail for 15 years and fired his sister from her job when she refused to have sex with him. Likewise, he became furious when he found out that the Sudanese boy who used to work for him was conspiring with his former business partner and sworn enemy, Sheikh Ahmed, to process the papers of his Indian maidservant. In India when Aganda marked you as a target and put your name on his hit list, no mortal being on the face of the earth could remove you from peril. Even the police could not protect you. The only way to escape this helpless situation was to kill the Ganda before he killed you. When the Ganda in Vakola accepted the assignment of Muhammad Khan, he did one thing to give himself unimpeded access to Babakir's apartment. He made an anonymous phone call to the secretary of the building and told him he would kidnap and kill his son and rape his wife and then shoot him if he refused to hand over the key to the apartment of the five Negro foreigners who were staying in his building. The secretary knew that when Aganda made a threat to someone's life, it was sure to pass. The words of Aganda were more predictable than any soothsayer or foreteller of events and had more force and effect than all the gods of India. So, in order to protect his life and his family, the secretary agreed to hand over the spare key without question. The Ganda told him he would send three of his boys to get the key from him. He also told him that both the watchman and the liftman were not to stand in the way when his goons entered the complex to get the spare key or when they needed access to the apartment of the five Negroes. The secretary in fear and trembling promised that he would comply with the demands and conditions set forth by the Ganda. The secretary assumed that the Ganda wanted to send his gangsters to rob the apartment. While Babakir and his four friends were taking their final exams, the three thugs arrived at the apartment building, got the spare key from the secretary, and entered the apartment of the five Negro students. 
They did a thorough search in every room and identified Babakir's bag through his photo ID card. They were not able to find the visas and tickets, but they did put the drugs inside Babakir's bag. They made sure to leave everything as it was before they left the apartment. After that, they locked the apartment and returned the spare key to the secretary and left. The secretary was surprised when he saw the three gangsters come out of the apartment empty-handed. He was sufficiently frightened and held his tongue not questioning what they had done inside the apartment. It was the hideous Muhammad Khan himself, who placed the anonymous phone call to the Bombay Narcotic Police and reported that there was drug activity taking place inside a certain apartment located at Vakola Colony. He refused to reveal his identity to the police, but gave them the building and apartment number in question and made sure to mention to the police there were African Negroes involved. The police could not trace the call because he made the call from a public phone. As expected, the Bombay police raided the apartment of the five Sudanese students and arrested them along with their four girlfriends. The next day when the wicked boss read the midday newspaper, he laughed until he fell out of his chair. Then, he went to his employees and showed them what the Negro boy who used to work for him had done. As soon as the police took all nine students away, the neighbors knocked down the door of their apartment and stole everything. They did not leave the furniture or anything and took even the tables and chairs. They also took the food out of the refrigerator. The apartment was left empty as if its tenants had vacated and moved to another place. Shortly after the robbery, the secretary brought in three jobless slum women and paid each one of them 20 rupees to clean up the apartment. Then, he called a carpenter and asked him to fix the battered and damaged door. After that, he rented the apartment to some foreign Arab students from Jordan and Palestine. Sheikh Fadiz bin Ahmed tried many times to contact his Sudanese pimp but to no avail. His many calls and letters to him went unanswered. After some time, the old Saudi concluded that, the Sudanese boy had stolen the tickets and visas and sold them. He already suspected the Sudanese wasn't on the level with him from the start. He doubted the money he sent to his beloved Rehana had ever reached her or that Babakir had ever made contact with her. In Bombay, you can sell anything even your own identity or bodily organs. Some poor Indians sell their kidneys to hoax doctors for illegal kidney transplants for treating sick rich Arabs. Sometimes, foreign students also sell their passports and other identification due to financial difficulties. The photo on their passport would then be changed to that of the purchaser and used to go to whatever country they wished to go to. Among the foreign students at Bombay University, the Nigerian students are known for their drugs trafficking and the Somali students are widely renowned in the art of counterfeit and forgery. Whatever you want from paper money to bank drafts, the Somalis are masters in their profession. I do not mean to be harsh in insinuating the Sudanese boy as a pimp for the wealthy old Saudi. Babakir al war knew exactly why Sheikh Ahmed is interested in Rehana Khan. So excuse me if my opinion of him is less than stellar. By helping him to get her into his country for basically pennies on a dollar, or pesos on a rupee, and the promise he would secure a job in the future, Babakir put himself in a position of a Sudanese pimp in the modern-day slave trade of the Arabs. A decent person would not help someone who wanted a woman for his own sexual pleasure, knowing she was being deceived with the offer of a maidservant visa. Rehana was under the impression the old Saudi offered her free visas and tickets as a gift because she was a Muslim like him. Instead, her life and the life of her daughter were sold and traded between broker and dealer. The typical Arab changes made servants annually as if they were turning in a trade for a new car or putting away summer clothes to prepare for the winter, or vice versa. If in the first year he chose a maidservant from Sri Lanka, the second year he would choose one from the Philippines the third year one from Indonesia, and the fourth from Pakistan, the fifth from India, etc., etc., etc. As soon as the maidservant reached his house, he would either rape her or buy her body with a few rials or dinars. The maidservant would work like a slave during the day and at night, her kafil, owner or master, would use her for his sexual pleasure and for his entertainment. Sometimes, 
the same maidservant might be shared by the father and his adult sons. A Pakistani policeman in a Gulf country was beaten to death by an angry Arab mob because he was quoted in a newspaper saying that the Pakistani girls who were working as maidservants were sex slaves to the Arabs. As recently as the 1950s, Saudi Arabia's slave population was estimated at 450,000, approximately 20% of the population. Saudi Arabia continues down to this very day to enslave people of all nations while their government and the governments of the world turn the other way for profit.